that was a joke. Good evening. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation, and he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to the same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas. Invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. But Ukraine, Ukraine can stop Putin. Ukraine. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that need to defend itself. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers in war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. But now, if it happens so that Ukraine, uh, due to various opinions and weakening and depleting of assistance, uh, uh, loses, Russia is going to enter Baltic states, NATO member states, and then the U.S. will have to send their sons and daughters exactly the same way as we are sending their sons and daughters to war. And they they will have to fight because it's a nature that we're talking about and they will be dying god forbid because it's a horrible thing walk away from our world leadership it wasn't long ago when a republican president named ronald reagan thundered mr gorbachev tear down this wall
Now. Now, my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader. I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. is a founding member of NATO, the military alliance of democratic nations, created after World War II to prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. If anybody believed the propaganda that they had heard for the last 50 years, they would have predicted that NATO would disappear. I mean, the justification for NATO was it's protecting the West from the Russian hordes. Okay, the Russian hordes are gone. What happens to NATO? It should have gone as well. It did it? No, it expanded. And that teaches you something. Uh, actually, what happened in detail is quite interesting. Uh, Gorbachev uh, uh, made a remarkable concession to the West. He agreed to let Germany form a united Germany, join a Western military alliance, a hostile military alliance. Now, if you just look at history, it's pretty clear what a, an amazing concession that was. I mean, Germany alone had almost destroyed Russia several times in the preceding century. And now Gorbachev was saying, okay, united Germany can be rearmed and can join a hostile military alliance, which makes it much more powerful. Well, of course, there was a, he thought he made an agreement. Uh, he thought that the West, meaning the United States, was agreeing uh, not to let NATO expand to the East. The phrase was not one inch to the East, meaning NATO would not extend to East Germany and of course would not extend further. And also, he thought he had a promise that NATO would become a more political organization. So the pres President Bush and the Secretary of State James Baker did promise that. They promised NATO would become a more political organization. It would not extend one inch to the East. However, Gorbachev made a serious error. And if any of you are intending to take on a course in diplomacy, you might pay attention to it. He only got a verbal promise. Uh, it was, he thought it was, it was a gentleman's agreement. You don't make gentlemen's agreements with savage, violent powers. So they made sure not to write it down. It was never written in words. It was just a gentleman's agreement. Uh, we have no doubt about what was said. Helmut Kohl said the same thing. Genscher said the same thing. Yeah, we promise not to extend an inch to the east. Well, what happened? Uh, NATO immediately expanded to East Germany, and under Clinton it expanded much farther through East, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, right up to the borders of the Soviet Union. Well, you know, Gorbachev was pretty upset, naturally, and the Russians reacted. There, were, there was more. Uh, Gorbachev had offered a nuclear weapons-free zone from the Arctic uh, uh, down to the Mediterranean. Uh, the, the U.S. didn't even consider that. It wasn't even discussed. Uh, and NATO has, in fact, expanded. Well, it's now not only going to the east, uh, the, uh, the happens to be Dutch Secretary of General of NATO announced uh, about a year ago uh, that NATO has to take responsibility for the entire global energy system. So it has to, what's called protect, mean, meaning ensure that we own uh, the sea lanes, the pipelines, and so on. And there was just a conference about two weeks ago in Washington 
headed by former Secretary of State Albright, which had a new, I forgot the name of it, it had a new mission for NATO to expand worldwide. Well, NATO is a U.S.-run military force, and it's now becoming an international, global U.S. intervention force. And the purpose of it, one purpose of it, is to, exactly as the questioner said, to integrate Europe into the U.S.-dominated military system. Now, that's what NATO was for in the first place. The one goal of NATO from the very beginning was to block Gaullist initiatives to make sure that Europe would not move in an independent course. And as the pretext for NATO disappeared, namely the Russians, uh, we can now see what it's all about. Uh, now NATO has expanded. No Russians, but it's expanded to a global U.S.-run military intervention force in which uh, Europe is absorbed. Now, Europe is dragging its feet. It's not doing it enthusiastically enough. And about a week ago, there was an important article by Richard Haas. He's the head of the Council on Foreign Relations. It's kind of like the main non-governmental uh, foreign relations establishment institution. He's a former high policymaker. Uh, the title of the article, which appeared in the London Financial Times, if you want to look it up, the title is Goodbye Europe. It says Europe is no longer playing its proper role as a major uh, actor in world affairs because it's not violent enough. Meaning, the point is, NATO is re uh, Europe is refusing to provide sufficient military force for the U.S.-run global uh, programs of uh, controlling you know, the world by force. So goodbye, Europe. You're not violent enough, so we don't want you anymore. We'll take somebody else. Actually, he doesn't really mean goodbye, Europe. It's just a, a chastising Europe for their failures to have uh, an adequate commitment to violence. But you still have to be absorbed in the U.S.-run system. We've made NATO stronger than ever. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. I've known for a long time is simple. We will not walk away.
in a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th. When insurrection stormed this very capital and placed a dagger to throw to American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They had come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots that steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. Ever since being elected to office, I ask all of you without regard to party to join together and defend democracy. Remember your oath of office is defending us all threats, foreign and domestic. Respect. Respect free and fair elections. Restore trust in our institutions. And make clear political violence has absolutely no place. No place in America. Zero place. Again. It's not hyperbole to suggest history is watching. We're watching. Your children and grandchildren will read about this day and what we do. History is watching another assault on freedom. Join us tonight as Latoya Beasley, a social worker from Birmingham, Alabama. 14 months ago, 14 months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have that second child. The Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state. Unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait. What her family got through should never have happened. Unless Congress acts, it could happen again. So tonight, let's stand up for families like hers. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. Guarantee the right to IVF. Guarantee it nationwide. Like most Americans, I believe Roe we Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader, defending reproductive freedom. And so much more. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos that has resulted. Joining us tonight is Kate Cox, the wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus in a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening to too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look, it's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, Justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you are about. Right
Clearly. Those bragging about overtraining Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot. We won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. If you, if you, the American people, send me a Congress to force the right to choose, I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. <laughs> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear, record losses, remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate, raging virus that took more than one million American lives of loved ones and millions left behind, a mental health crisis, a Isolation and loneliness. The president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in the news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. <laughs> so let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities, building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. Investing in all America, in all Americans, to make every sure everyone has a fair shot. And we leave no one, no one behind. The pandemic no longer controls our lives. The vaccine that saved us from COVID is, are now being used to beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. Our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years, a record, a record. At 50-year lows, a record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for Black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs in America. and counting. 
Where is it written we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? We are, and we will. More people have health insurance today. More people have health insurance today than ever before. The racial wealth gap is as small as it's been in 20 years. Wages keep going up, inflation keeps coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9% to 3%, the lowest in the world, and 10 even lower. The landing is and will be soft. And now, instead of importing, importing foreign products and exporting American jobs, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. It takes time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America has been the law of the land since the 1930s. Past administrations, including my predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy America. Not anymore. On my watch, federal projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. Time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America has been the law of the land since the 1930s. Past administrations, including my predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy America. Not anymore. On my watch, federal projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. Good paying American jobs. And thanks to our Chips and Science Act, the United States is investing more in research and development than ever before. During the pandemic, a shortage of semiconductors, chips, that drove up the price of everything from cell phones to automobiles. And by the way, we invented those chips right here in America. Well, instead of having to import them, instead of private companies are now investing billions of dollars to build new chip factories here in America, creating tens of thousands of jobs. Many of those jobs paying $100,000 a year and don't require a college degree. Thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 46,000 new projects have been announced all across your communities. If any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. Modernize our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. Providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in tribal communities because of my investment in the family farm. 
President, I'm testing the family to live by my Secretary of Agriculture. He knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better able to stay in the family for the those farms so and their children and grandchildren want to leave, leave home to make a living. It's transformative. Great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois, home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Before I came to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. And I was elected to office and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plant open and get these jobs back and together we succeeded. Instead of auto factories shutting down, auto factories reopening, a new state-of-the-art battery factories being built to power those cars there at the same Mr. Belvedere, I say, instead of your town being left behind, your community is moving forward again. Because instead of watching auto job, jobs in the future go overseas, 4,000 union jobs with higher wages are building the future in Belvedere right here in America. Showing once again, Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. America's coming back. It's because of you our future is burning. It's because of you that tonight we can probably say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Tonight, tonight, I want to talk about the future of possibilities that we can build together. A future where the days of trickle-down economics are over, and the wealthy and the biggest corporations no longer get to, all the tax breaks. And by the way, I understand corporations. I come from a state that has more corporations invested than every one of your states in the state of the United States combined. And I represented for 36 years. I'm not anti-corporation, but I grew up in a home where trickle-down economics didn't put much on my dad's kitchen table. pay more for prescription drugs than anywhere in the world. It's wrong, and I'm ending it. That's not just saving seniors' money. It's saving taxpayers' money. We cut the federal deficit by $160 billion. This year, Medicare is negotiating lower prices for some of the costliest drugs on the market to treat everything from heart disease to arthritis. It's now time to go further and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for 500 different drugs over the next decade. They're making a lot of money, guys. And they'll still be extremely profitable. It'll not only save lives, it'll save taxpayers another $200 billion. Next year, the same law caps total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 to $2,000 a year. Even for expensive cancer drugs, it costs ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. I want to cap prescription drug costs at two thousand dollars a year for everyone. Yeah. Folks, I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but everyone again, Air Force One, we can fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow. I mean, excuse me, and well, even Moscow probably. <laughs> 
<coughs> bring your prescription with you, and I promise you I'll get it for you for 40% the cost you're paying now. Same company, same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, it's, it's still a very big deal. can no longer be denied health insurance because of freezes and condition. Well, my predecessor, the many in this chamber, want to take this red prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. We stopped you 50 times before we will stop you again. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. We've cut red tape so builders can get federally financing, which is already helping build a record 1.7 million new housing units nationwide. Remain the strongest economy in the world. We need to have the best education system in the world. When I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt with student loans, I fixed two student loan programs that already existed to reduce the burden of student debt for nearly four million Americans, including nurses, fire. While we're at it, I want the public school teachers a raise. Let these teachers come in and act as if they have nothing wrong. They've done nothing wrong. A mistake? How long of a mistake? How many mistakes are we going to take before my child almost lost her life? They didn't tell me that my child was suicidal. You allowed these teachers to open their classrooms teaching predatorial information to a young child, a mindful child that doesn't even know how to comprehend it all. How do you not know what was going on on your own campuses? Did you think that no parent would ever come forward? You will not quiet me today. I will stand here today and protect my child along with every other child who has not come forward yet. Do you, do you, do they have psychiatry degrees that I was unaware of? Because I didn't hire them, okay? I did not hire them to sit there and nitpick my child's brain. You took away my ability to parent my child. Even before I had any knowledge, I didn't even get to show support. You asked for support, I didn't get a chance. You planted seeds, Ms. Caldera and Ms. Barack, Mr. Brock and you, Ms. Kagarin. Your job was to educate my child in math, science, English, etc. Do your job and let me do mine. They added more to the national debt than any presidential term in American history. They haven't yet. In fact, the child tax credit I passed during the pandemic cut taxes for millions of working families and cut child poverty in half. End it now. You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. <laughs> They're making great sacrifices, 8.2%. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay.
tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of the aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security and Medicare or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. Joe Biden tried to cut Social Security and Medicare for decades. When I argued that we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I tried it twice, I tried it a third time, and I tried it a fourth time. Senator, we have a deficit. We have Social Security and Medicare looming. Would you consider looking at those programs, age of eligibility, absolutely. cost of living, put it all on the table? The answer is absolutely you have to. I mean, you know, it's the, one of the things that my, you know, the, the political advisors say to me is, whoa, don't touch that third. Look, American people aren't stupid. It's a real simple proposition. Social Security is not the hard one to solve. Medicare, that is the gorilla in the room. And you've got to put all of it on the table. Everything. Everything. Here's what he said. Paul Ryan was correct. When he did the tax code, what's the first thing he decided we had to go after? Social Security mm. and Medicare. Yeah. Now, we need to do something about Social Security and Medicare. That's the only way. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's why it's cracking down on corporations engaging in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to healthcare to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer, same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrink placing. Look, I'm also getting rid of junk fees. Those hidden fees at the end of your bill that are there without your knowledge. My administration announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. <laughs> Banks and credit card companies are allowed to charge what it costs them to, in, to instigate the, the, the collection. And that's more held on like $8 and 30 some dollars. They don't like it. The credit card companies don't like it. But I'm saving American families $20 billion a year with all the junk fees I'm eliminating. And so does this. In November, my team began serious negotiations with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate would endorse the bill as well, a majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels a political win, he viewed it as a political win for me and a political loser for him. It's not about him, it's not about me. I'd be a winner, not really. I... Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of the thousands of people being killed by illegals? Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. This evening we've got brand new numbers, striking numbers that have never been seen before and they may reshape how you think about illegal immigration. So you've heard the same line a million times. It's repeated like a mantra by the left during every debate on the subject. All immigrants are hardworking and law-abiding. They do jobs you wouldn't consider doing and they do them cheerfully. They sacrifice for their families in ways you probably don't. In fact, and this is always the last point, it's always delivered with the confident satisfaction of someone shutting down a debate with superior data, undocumented immigrants actually commit fewer crimes on average than native-born Americans. Not only are immigrants more virtuous than you are, but they're safer to be around. In other words, stop complaining. They're your superiors. 
But wait, are we sure that that is true? Are people who are in this country precisely because they were willing to break our immigration laws really less likely to break other kinds of laws? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yet until today, strangely enough, no one could say for sure whether it was true because reliable statistics didn't seem to exist. Our government tracks pretty much every trend and every phenomenon you can think of from how many pounds of pistachio nuts are recalled every year to how many fifth graders are injured on swing sets to how many people die in bathtubs. This is a nation of record keepers. We're overseen by an army of spreadsheet wielding bureaucrats. Numbers control our lives, except on this subject. Somehow, the government went for years without honestly trying to track the volume of crime committed by illegal immigrants in this country. Maybe they were too incompetent to do it. More likely, they didn't want you to know the answer or to think about it even. In any case, we now for the first time have the actual numbers, and here they are. According to statistics from the U.S. Sentencing Commission, non-citizens are actually far more likely to commit serious crimes than Americans are. Non-citizens account for 22%, more than a fifth of all federal murder convictions, 18% of fraud convictions, 33% of money laundering convictions, 29% of drug trafficking convictions, and 72% of convictions for drug possession. Meanwhile, the non-citizen percentage of the American population, about 7%. So that is a massively disproportionate amount of crime. Not even close. No, immigrants are not more law-abiding and less dangerous than Americans. That's totally untrue. Indeed, it's the opposite of the truth. Non-citizens are more likely to be arrested, convicted, and imprisoned for serious crimes than people who were born here. Much more likely. So why didn't we know this until now? Why have so many people been lying to us about this for so long? That's a question we plan to ask a whole bunch of people. Well, we'll start tonight with Ali Narani. He is executive director of the National Immigration Forum, and he joins us in the studio. Thanks all for coming on. Thanks for having me. So this is a conversation I've had, I don't know, a dozen times in the past month uh, on this show where people say, well, actually, non-citizens are less likely to commit crimes. And they cite some Cato study or something. Now we have definitive numbers on this from the U.S. Sentencing Commission that shows that non-citizens are not just more likely to commit crimes, serious crimes, like murder and fraud, drug trafficking, but far more likely to commit those crimes. Why are we just learning this now? Well, the bigger question, I think, Tucker, is how do we make sure that we are keeping the nation secure in a way that's using our valuable law enforcement resources the best way? Because I'll be the first to tell you that we are a nation of laws, and we're, in law, and we're a nation that should be keeping Americans safe. Right. So let's make sure that law enforcement are in a position to do their job and get those violent threats, those public safety threats, off the streets, particularly if they're immigrants. And the way you do that is that you make sure that the immigrant community can trust local law enforcement. So that's why I'm concerned about the direction of the administration when it comes to immigration enforcement because they're actually undermining the ability uh, of local law so, enforcement. So enforcing, I, this is like this weird alchemy where enforcing border laws makes us less safe somehow. But let me ask you, if 22% of all federal murder convictions are of non-citizens, but only 7% of the population is non-citizen, that suggests we're letting in the wrong people. It suggests that we should be doing a much better job in terms of local law enforcement. And the way to do that is to make sure that the immigrant community is in a position to report crimes. Because at the end of the day, those those individuals who are immigrants who are committing those crimes, you know who the like the most likely victim is? The immigrant. Well, that's irrelevant. Wait, wait, so, hold on. So, wait, wait, so wait, hold on. so you're saying that, wait, wait, hold on. I, let's just pause and let sure. these numbers kind of settle. Because these are not been public until today. 22% of all federal murder convictions, non-citizens. 33% of money laundering convictions, non-citizens. 28% drug trafficking, 72% of all convictions for drug possession, non-citizens. Non-citizens are far more likely to commit serious crimes than native-born citizens, um, and foreign-born citizens for that matter. Why shouldn't this make us want to radically curtail immigration into the country? It makes me radically want to make sure, I radically want to make sure that law enforcement are able to do their job because again, those those crimes are being committed within the immigrant community. So the, what's no, 
well, some no, are no, but that's not. I mean, no. some are, some aren't. Well, hold on. We, we've but got it, these numbers today, so it, we actually don't really know where these crimes are being committed. We don't know anything about it other than this. Like, this is the first. No, but if you actually, if you, you look at the that. research, the research shows that the immigrant community is a victim of is the disproportionate. But it doesn't victim. matter. So then, but, like, it, what, but what but matters? Why are we letting in people who are many times more likely to commit murder, fraud, drug trafficking than people who are born here? Why don't we think through who we let in? Doesn't it suggest that to you? It suggests to me that our immigration system is fundamentally broken, and we need to make sure that those individuals who are here, who are undocumented, are registering for legal status, passing a criminal background check, learning English, and coming out no, of the No, I get that you've got your pre-existing priorities that you want. I understand you do it for a living, okay, and I respect that. But again, for the third time, these are brand new numbers. We didn't know them when we woke up this morning. Now we do. The debate is over. Non-citizens far more likely to commit dangerous crimes than citizens. So, with that in mind, does that shock you? It shocks me that we haven't been uh, approaching the problem the correct way. But why have we been saying the opposite with such great authority all these years? Well, actually, you know, according to Cato or some think tank, I mean, can we just pause and say, you know, we were totally wrong about what we've been saying? The problem here is that we want to get violent criminals off the streets. Is that correct? We don't want them in here in the first it, place. We do, we do not so want why them are we making law enforcement deal with these people? Why don't we stop it at the border and then we don't have to put our police and citizens at risk? I think that's a great idea. And yeah. the other way you do that is that you make sure that you have a functioning legal immigration system and a process for people to go through. The only people who are hiding for law, from law enforcement... Really? I thought, don't we bring in more than a million people legally every year? It's clearly out of more whack. More than any other need. country in it's, the world? We're also a much bigger country than almost no, any other we're country. we're not, actually. Law, in our, in our workforce is, in, in our workforce is actually much more dynamic and fluid maybe than okay but right? leaving the economics okay. of it aside I mean that's another show another debate but I, I just I just want to acknowledge that one of the core operating assumptions that we have had for years and I've been at the center of this mm -hmm. debate was wrong not just wrong but totally wrong it was a lie does that make you reassess what you thought a little bit what I want to try to assess is how do we actually solve the problem I mean we can you know if you want to, you know, to, to quibble about statistics, you should bring somebody from Cato. Cato yeah, but it's not, it's not quibbling. It's my, my, what we've been claiming I, I, is the very opposite of the truth. I am focused on solving problems. That problem is individuals who are here who are violent criminals and public safety threats. I want them off the streets, Tucker. The only way you can do that is to make sure that the crimes they commit are being reported by the victims. And if the victim is an immigrant, we need to make sure that okay, they can that, but, but why? Well, clearly someone's reporting these crimes. We don't have a problem with that because, again, the I mean... We have disproportionately uh, big numbers here. My question is, why do you think non-citizens are committing crimes at a far greater rate than Americans are? I think we got to make sure that individuals who are coming to the country have been properly vetted. They're going through the process they need to. And the folks who are here and so are undocumented. they haven't been properly vetted. And the folks that are here who are undocumented, we need to require they pass a criminal background check. That is our biggest problem right now. Because the individual undocumented immigrant who's a violent threat to our public safety, they, they're the one's hiding. In Why wouldn't we just build a wall? Like the public kind of wants that. What's the argument against that exactly? If you actually want to solve a problem at the border, you want to actually focus where the problem is. The majority of drugs, guns, and money are smuggled at ports of entry. But these the are not drugs and guns and money. The these are people those committing indivi crimes. Those so individuals like, who are committing crime, those crimes, they're coming in through but, ports but of so entry. But do you think a, a wall wouldn't help at all? Because why? I want to I want to put money where the risk is on the border. Where the majority of drugs... Well, we didn't even know there was this risk until about two hours ago. So like, but, I mean, maybe we should pause and think about these numbers because they are shocking. You will concede that. Thank you, Ellie. Appreciate it. Politics and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill. Join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together. But that's what he, apparently here's what he will not do. I will not demonize immigrants saying they are poison in the blood of our country. Home to Native Americans, and ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Home to people of every place, from every place on earth. They came freely. Some came in chains. Some came when famine struck, like my ancestral family in Ireland. simple choice. We can fight about fixing the border or we can fix it. I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now.
But 59 years later, their force is taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis is a great friend to many of us here. But if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of march with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Let me say it again. The 2020 election was the most secure election in American history. Period. This same side accuses anyone who disagrees with them of perpetrating a big lie or the big delusion. The big lie keeps getting repeated. The big lie is just that, a big lie. These techniques are used every single day by law enforcement. In Across the country, we buy 10 trillion signals. So what was the criterion that you set? Final decision was they had to have been to 10 or more drop boxes, meaning unique visits inside of a space, and five or more visits to one, of the, one or more of these organizations. Let's identify a large number of drop boxes and multiple trips, and that way we're going to catch not all the offenders, right, but the worst offenders. What is a mule? A mule is, by our definition, a person that is involved in picking up ballots from locations and running them to the drop boxes. So you have the collectors on the one hand, you have the stash houses, which are the, the nonprofits, and then you have the, the mules that are doing the drops. Zoom in here. So the mule is the delivery man. The mule is the delivery man. woman. And, and what you're saying is they have a starting point or multiple starting points and then they have the end point. Point. And the end point is the drop box, That's right. right? That's right. But you're saying that they're, they, they get the ballots from somewhere and then they go deposit them in right. multiple drop boxes. What you see here on the screen is a single person on a single day in Atlanta, Georgia. They went to 28 drop boxes in five organizations in one day. What are the orange dots? Those are drop boxes. And what is the blue tracks? That is a smoothed out pattern of life so that we could take the sort of the movement of the individual cell phone signals, marry them together into something that's visual. I think it was Pennsylvania that really gave Biden the election. Philadelphia alone, we've identified more than 1,100 mules at rates well beyond anything we'd seen closer to 50 drop boxes each. Each guy going to 50 each, drop boxes. Each, 1,100. We saw people driving back and forth to New Jersey across the bridge. But you're saying the ballots may not even be from Philadelphia or from Pennsylvania. Well, we're saying, we're saying somebody should but investigate. But you're saying that the origin yeah. point appears to be Jersey. It's one thing to have the scientific evidence, which is persuasive on its own merits, but do you have video evidence? We do. How much of it do you have? Four million minutes of surveillance video around the country. And I believe it was the state of Georgia saying this video does not exist and we can't tell you why it doesn't exist. Right, that was in, in Fulton County. We have correspondence like that from a lot of states in the absence of video. And that geospatial data is key to decoding you know, what the greater scheme was. But in the and so these are the kind of things, four million minutes of this. This was an organized effort to subvert a free and fair election. This is organized crime. You can't look at this data in its aggregate and believe anything otherwise. Now we come to the most important question of all. Was the magnitude of vote trafficking in these key swing states enough to tip the balance in the 2020 presidential election? Georgia, 250 mules, averaging 24 drop box visits and five illegal ballots per drop. That's 30,000 illegally trafficked votes, far more than the 12,000 vote difference between Trump and Biden. So Georgia with 16 electoral votes, moves over into the Trump column.
In Arizona, the numbers are roughly the same. 200 mules, averaging 20 drop box visits and five illegal ballots per drop. That's 20,000 illegal votes. Again, these illegal votes are substantially more than the 10,000 vote margin that gave the state's 11 electoral votes to Biden. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania alone, 1,100 mules. Averaging 50 drop box visits and five ballots per visit, that's 275,000 illegal votes, again, comfortably exceeding the 80,000 vote margin between Trump and Biden. So Pennsylvania's 20 electoral votes goes for Trump. Shockingly, even this narrow way of looking at just our 2,000 mules in these swing states gives Trump the win with 279 electoral votes to Biden's 259. But no one thinks that our 2,000 mules were the only mules trafficking illegal votes. To widen the search, Greg and his team lowered the criterion from 10 or more to five or more drop boxes. This revealed a huge upsurge in the number of mules from 2,000 to 54,000. 54,000 mules. Next, they used a very conservative estimate of just three ballots per drop box visit. Now, when we multiply this increased number of mules times the five drop box visits per mule times just three illegal votes per drop we find election fraud on an astonishing scale. In Wisconsin, 83,565 illegal votes were trafficked. In Georgia, 92,670. In Pennsylvania, 209,505. In Michigan, 226,590. And in Arizona, 207,435. Using this calculus, Trump would have won all the key states. And the final electoral vote, 305 to 233. And stop. Stop denying another core value of America. Our diversity across American life. Banning books is wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans... I have your back. The work is right. Raise the federal minimum wage because every worker has a right to a decent living more than seven bucks an hour. Also making history by confronting the climate crisis, not denying it. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. At least I hope you don't. I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. State the obvious. All Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. The year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through, no, through my American Rescue Plan, which every American voted against, I'm mad at, we made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year, the murder rate showed the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years. But we have more to do. Other kinds of violence I want to stop. 
With us tonight is Jasmine, whose nine-year-old sister Jackie was murdered with 21 classmates and teachers in elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. Very soon after that happened, Jill and I went to Uvalde for a couple days. We spent hours and hours with each of the families. We heard their message, so everyone in this room, in this chamber, could hear the same message. The constant refrain, and I was there for hours meeting with every family. They said, do something. Do something. Well, I did do something by establishing the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House with the Vice President leading the charge. Thank you for doing it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Meanwhile, my predecessor told the NRA he's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. Oh. After another shooting in Iowa recently, he said, when asked what to do about it, he said, just get over it. There's his quote, just get over it. None of this violates the Second Amendment or vilifies responsible gun owners. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crises abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people, for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent people, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also... <coughs> We'll also work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it, by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and sur surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a, ha excuse me, Israel has a added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards, under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. <laughs> 
standing in the shop he owns in the occupied West Bank town of Dura, Baha Abu Ras is playing video footage on his phone from Monday. He says it shows the moment an Israeli soldier used him as a human shield, marching him up a street while resting a rifle on his shoulder and guiding him toward the center of town. Two Israeli soldiers advanced carefully behind. What happened today is that the army raided Dura. I was at my shop. The army asked to search the shop. He asked me to let the workers leave the shop. They searched the shop and myself. They took us outside and put me on the ground. Then he took me toward the jeeps. He told the workers to go and he told me that he will use me as a human shield. The young people shouldn't hurl stones. You will walk in front of me. That's what happened, and he took me toward the center of the town. Asked about the incident, the Israeli military had no immediate comment. It said in an earlier statement that troops in Dura had used live fire to disperse about 100 people who had thrown stones and firebombs at them. The Palestinian Health Ministry said at least 10 people were injured and two men were killed during the raid. Israel has carried out repeated raids on West Bank towns since gunmen from the Palestinian militant group Hamas in the Gaza Strip went on a rampage in southern Israel on October 7th, sparking the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza. The use of human shields is widely condemned under international law. Israel has accused Hamas of using civilians as human shields in Gaza, allegations that the militant group has denied. Tel Aviv has been accusing Hamas of using Palestinians as human shields over the years, leveraging this claim to justify the thousands of Palestinian civilians that has been killed in Israel's indiscriminate bombardment of Palestinian Gaza since October 7. Now, by definition, human shields are civilians who are utilized to directly assist in military operations and protect military targets in warfare. And the practice is strictly prohibited according to international law, although it has repeatedly pointed pointed the finger at Hamas, Israel has so far fallen short of providing any concrete proof to substantiated claims. I'm a medical doctor, I'm a civilian. I have been all around in Shifa Hospital for 16 years. I've been walking freely everywhere. I've taken pictures and videos. I have never seen any signs of any military command center in Shifa. But I think again you have to ask the Israelis, where is the proof? In fact, Israeli forces themselves have been accused of using Palestinians as human shields by prominent international bodies, including the United Nations and Amnesty International, with the latter having published a report in 2009, in which the use of human shields was characterized as a common practice employed by Israeli soldiers. Here are five instances when credible accusations were made against the Israel forces for using in Palestinians as human shields. In 2004, Israeli police were accused of tying 13-year-old Mohammed Saeed Badwan to a border police vehicle to discourage Palestinian protesters from demonstrating against Israel's separation wall in the occupied West Bank. Activists with rabbis for human rights who were on the scene say the boy was violently beaten while he was still tied to the vehicle and that their attempt to intervene only resulted in them getting arrested. In 2014, Israel forces were accused of using Ramadan Muhammad Kadei as a human shield. When they raided his village, shot his father at close range, tied his hands together and took him and other family members including his cousin Allah Abdul Aziz who claimed a soldier told him, don't worry, if Hamas sees you, they will not fire at us. Again, in 2014, the Israeli army allegedly held 17-year-old Ahmed Abu Raida at gunpoint, forcing him to search for tunnels using his bare hands to during a ground invasion of Palestine's Gaza. He was reportedly interrogated, physically tortured, and deprived of food for days. In 2022, Israeli soldiers were accused of forcing 16-year-old Ahed Mohammed Rida Mereb to stand in front of an Israeli military vehicle when they raided Jenin in the occupied West Bank. Here is how she described the ordeal. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to go
في الوصف ايش خوف رعب اعياط ديك نفس كل شيء In March 2018, 37-year-old Abdurrahim Gaith was reportedly used as a human shield during a clash between the Israeli army and Palestinian youths. Israeli troops allegedly seized him from his car. As he was driving home, tied him up and left him in the middle of the road as they hid behind his car and fired towards the protesters. Ironically, Israel's Supreme Court outlawed the use of human shields in 2005, with Tel Aviv's then army chief ordering soldiers to report violations to their superiors. However, first-hand accounts and footage from the ground strongly indicate the army's lack of adherence to the ruling to date. So, could Israel be using its unsubstantiated claims that Hamas employs human shields to attempt to absolve itself of the thousands of civilians it has killed in its brutal bombardment campaign in Gaza? the mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. Maybe with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I build a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. I've ordered strikes to degrade the Houthi capability and defend U.S. forces in the region. As Commander-in-Chief, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and our military personnel. For years, I've heard many of my Republican and Democratic friends say that China is on the rise and America is falling behind. They've got it backwards. I've been saying it for over four years, even when I wasn't president. America is rising. We have the best economy in the world. And since I've come to office, our GTP is up, our trade deficit with China is down to the lowest point in over a decade. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. for that matter than any time as well. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills. There's more to pass my unity agenda. Strength and penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? bipartisan privacy legislation to protect our children online. Harness. Harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. AI voice impersonations and more and keep our truly sacred obligation to train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't.
and remind us, remind us that we can do big things like end cancer as we know it, and we will. story of resentment, revenge, and retribution.